afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. We often read or hear someone being called out as a cynic or cynical. The implication is often negative. Nowadays, a cynic is thought of as someone who demeans or criticizes without providing solutions. As it turns out, the origin of this word has a much different connotation. Today, we'll learn about this ancient philosophy, what it looked, sounded, and yes, smelled like, and how having a cynical approach to life could be a benefit in today's world. In a new book, How to Say No, An Ancient Guide to the Art of Cynicism, UVM Classics professor Mark D. Usher introduces us to the original cynics, traces their influences, and translates their wisdom for modern life. Mark Usher joins us over Zoom. Thank you so much for coming on and teaching us about how to be better cynics, Professor Usher. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Diogenes would be very happy for the publicity. <laughs> Indeed. So to start, what is the Greek origin of the word cynic? And, and what did it mean to be a cynic in ancient Greece? Great. So uh, cynic is a, a Greek word that means dog-like. And uh, the cynics were called dogs by their detractors because they, they basically behaved like dogs. They, they lived out of doors. They did all their uh, private business out in public. Uh, that includes uh, defecating, urinating, copulating, <laughs> use any sort of uh, Latin, Latin based euphemism you want to describe bodily functions. Um, and, and they did this on purpose and they did this to kind of prove a point that um, people, uh, you know, we, have, we live according to cultural conventions uh, to an extent that is sort of harmful to us. And if we look to nature for our guide and to animals uh, uh, for how to live, they live more in harmony with uh, their environments. And so the cynics were trying to, you know, show us that in their lifestyle. And cynicism was very much a lifestyle and not like a, uh, a philosophy you would study. Right. So this was in the, in the fourth century BC. Um, and Let's talk about why this lifestyle. Was it really all for show? Was it to provoke outrage? Was it, uh, you know, what, what was their goal by acting dog-like? Well, uh, it, it was for show in a way, but it wasn't just for show. So they were trying to make a public statement about our reliance on conventions of culture and things that we think that we need, uh, whether they be uh, institutions or social norms or even uh, items, uh, food, types of food, uh, types of activities that we engage in. And they were keen to show that uh, we're dependent upon them. And they were uh, seekers of autonomy. They were freedom seekers in, in, in the best sense of the word. And they felt that if you, you didn't have anything, nobody could take anything away from you. So they lived a life of voluntary poverty uh, in which they begged for their food, which is one of the reasons why they were called dogs. Um, right. If you've ever been to modern Athens, uh, one of the most notable features is there are plenty of stray dogs running around the streets of modern Athens. The same was true in antiquity. Uh, and so they embraced that, uh, that moniker and they uh, kind of played it up a little bit to show this contrast between living according to nature and living merely according to cultural convention. Well, one of the most popular stories, a Diogenes is said to have had a run-in with one of the most well-known and most famous Greeks by way of Macedonia, Alexander the Great. Uh, what happened when those two met? So there are, there are a few uh, stories of encounters of Diogenes with great men, and the one with Alexander is probably the, the best known and probably the best, uh, best put. So Alexander comes by and Diogenes at that point, he lived out of doors. He was voluntarily homeless and uh, he lived in a, uh, a giant storage jar called a pithos. And he was uh, there one day uh, sunning himself beside his storage jar home. And Alexander paid him a visit uh, uh, and said, ask me for whatever you would like and it's yours, uh, thinking that Diogenes was in need. And Diogenes sort of, you know, opened his eyes and said, well, could you please stand out, out of my sunshine? Uh, and so it's a, it's a, you know, the story shows that Diogenes, all he needs is, is what nature provides. You know, Mr. Mr. Man of Culture, Mr. Man of Power uh, has nothing to offer somebody who, who needs nothing and is perfectly self-satisfied. Um, so it's a it's a great uh, great story and kind of captures cynicism in a nutshell. Right, but don't block my sunshine. 
<laughs> Don't block my sunshine. Stand out of my, this is my sun. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you write in your book that none of Diogenes' words survive. Uh, they're only stories like uh, that one that you mentioned. So how do we know about Diogenes, his philosophy, and, and why should we believe it today? Right. The, the cynics were uh, some of the, one of the great oralists of, of, of antiquity. So you know, you've got Jesus who never wrote anything himself or the Buddha who never wrote anything, but his disciples, their disciples passed on their, their words and their teachings. The cynics are, are, are somewhat similar, but I like to think of it as like the cynics became a meme. Their, their acted speech, their acted out speech, their, their stunts um, uh, that they performed in public became so memorable and so talked about that they they passed by word of mouth and then they became something that people would want to kind of improvise on. So uh, in, in later antiquity, it was a school exercise actually to write um, what would Diogenes have done or what would Diogenes have said in this uh, situation. And so uh, some of what we have about the cynics are these sorts of uh, anecdotes that were I'm going to say invented, but they were invented in the spirit of the man himself. Hmm. So in that sense, they're true and accurate. So it's actually even better than the truth. The fiction, <laughs> in a sense, is even better than the truth. Um, but again, obviously, he had an impact. And um, and to, to, to be memorable, you have to do memorable things. So I think much of what is said about the cynics is definitely true in spirit, um, even Close. in instant. Close enough. So, so, yeah. what's, so what's your favorite story about Diogenes um, or the ancient yeah. cynics? Oh my gosh, the, the, the pickings are so good. I, I'm not sure. Uh, here's one. Uh, just uh, So Diogenes was uh, traveling, according to his story, from Aegina, an island off from At Attica, to Athens, and he was captured by pirates and then put on the auction block to be so sold as a slave. And at the auction, uh, the slave driver uh, said, what can you do? Uh, and he said, govern people, rule over people. Uh, and just at that moment, a rich man from Corinth, a name, his name was Xeniades, was passing by and he heard Diogenes say that. And he thought that that was pretty cheeky and that must be a pretty intelligent you know, slave. So he bought Diogenes, bought, brought him back to his home and put him in charge of educating his two children. And uh, the, the, the story goes is that the children fell in love with Diogenes. They were his, you know, they were, he was his their favorite tutor and teacher, governor, and uh, uh, and they became cynics when they grew up. Um, so it, it's it's one of several stories that attempt to domesticate um, the cynics somewhat uh, to make them user friendly to everyday people living, you know ordinary lives. Right, but then they kind of infected the kids uh, with this as well. So, right. the, oh, no, stop yeah. <laughs> so, so the cynics embrace this very simplistic, less is more lifestyle. What did their influence um, have on, on, on public actions, uh, on behavior to those that, that they called out? Is there evidence of behavioral change at that time or, or later? Well, yeah, I mean, look around us, right? Um, I'm not sure there's much evidence of change. I mean, they were they were advocates of, of degrowth and as you just put it, uh, of a less is more philosophy. And, um, you know, in, in the larger scheme of things, um, uh, society has not changed in that direction, which is why the cynics are uh, as relevant as they were in the fourth century BCE. Mm -hmm. um, but they did attract a lot of disciples, and it's really quite amazing, given the lifestyle that uh, you know was was called for to be a cynic. Um, and pretty much every Hellenistic city, that is, cities uh, after the fourth century uh, up until late antiquity, so the fifth century AD, had its resident cynic. Um, and it became sort of mascots where they were like public reminders of of uh, of the excess that most people were engaging in. So um, it, it, it had a longevity, the, the movement. And um, even though, you know, the, the impact was in pockets and uh, on an individual uh, basis. Sure. So, so you had to, you had to translate the ancient Greek sources into modern English. Talk about the challenge of translation and and how you chose to walk that fine line between accuracy and, and understanding for us today. Uh, translating the the cynic anecdotes is is a lot of fun because they're, they're almost every one is humorous. I mean, the, the the point is to make a joke at somebody else's expense, and that's that's the kernel of what the modern sense of cynicism, the, the modern word cynic. Uh, has has taken over, but um, again they were they were much more more, more serious about that. So in translating, um, you know, 
uh, people talk about accuracy in translation, but I find uh, accuracy is overrated, meaning that a lot of times when people say accuracy, they talk about, they mean pedantry. Um, hmm. What you really want to capture is the is obviously what the what the original text says, but you also want to ca capture the spirit of it and what it means in contemporary setting. So uh, that that's what I tried to do in, in translating, and it was uh, uh, it was a lot of fun to do. Well, what about that wisdom? Um, how what what wisdom can we take for today that the ancient cynics gave to us? Um, well, they're, they're less is more philosophy, they're put up and make do uh, philosophy. Um, I think they speak to the whole decluttering and detachment <laughs> movement. Uh, uh, Marie Kondo has nothing on the cynics um, uh, in that regard. And, um, you know, they also were aware in, a, in a, an amazingly prescient way, for, for me at least, of what modern economists call uh, externalities. And uh, that is the harm that's caused by one's uh, personal indulgence, but also uh, societal excess. So we, we tend not to think um, uh, of, of what happens down the line when we buy that television set or when we buy the new car, uh, even if it's an electric car. But the cynics uh, seem to understand that. And one of the passages in the book uh, emphasizes uh, one cynic decrying the harm that our indulgence causes uh, other people and the environment. Right, so it's not just about denial, it's really about awareness and knowledge of the costs of indulgence and, and, and luxury. Um, so exactly. it, they also would certainly promote our local, by local movement. Well, exactly. They, they, in that same passage, he talks about, you know, you, 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 all the expense you take to, to, to seek luxuries from afar, um, it's much better to buy what's close to hand and it's more efficient. It, it's just as satisfying uh, and uh, it doesn't cause that kind of harm that I just described. So they were definitely by locals. So, Professor Mark Usher, thank you so much for your time today and explaining what the cynics are all about. Thank you very much. So Mark's uh, most recent book is called How to Say No, An Ancient Guide to the Art of Cynicism. Uh, you can ask your local librarian about it or look for it wherever you buy books. And that's our program for today. Thank you for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard, stay well.